Hey guys, welcome back. So now getting back into our talks of Dawn of X, and with doing so, beginning our talks on Excalibur, which initially took some deep cuts in a direction that I wasn't too crazy about, but in relation to everything else going on in Marauders, X-Force, New Mutants, and really just watching how it's starting to unfold, it made me kind of go back and take another look. So let's get into it. But first, if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to catch the spills every week, and don't forget to hit that bell up top so we can squat up in the comments for the first hour. Alright, so essentially with the series starting off in Camelot within Otherworld to where here Morgan Le Fay is being attacked by the forces of someone she calls the White Witch, which I have my theories on and we'll get into that pretty early as well. But one of the things I was thinking early on and I told myself like when I do this video I'm gonna make sure I'm gonna make this clear so that people don't get it confused with some of the other recent videos and that first thing that I want to get out the way is that this is not the same Morgan Le Fay that we've talked about recently with Weapon H and I really feel like I gotta get this out the way because in my mind I see the comment section of the future <laughs> and for good reason I can see a lot of the people getting the two mixed up but just to be clear that Morgan Le Fay who I usually refer to as Queen Morgan Le Fay she comes from Earth 15 238 to where later she was trapped in Weird World sold into slavery and then during the incursion Weird World was saved by God Emperor Doom to whom during Secret Wars he made it a part of Battle World along with portions of Earth 15 238 and from there she became the Baroness slash ruler of Weird World well really Baroness during Secret Wars and ruler after and so now I mention this not only to make the distinction clear but also as a slight reminder with her returning in the Weapon H series after being in prison and having her power drained for some time by Dario Agar that once again as a reminder she's still out there but these are two different people and I got more about her in the Weapon H playlist but I just wanted to make it clear that that's not the Morgan Le Fay that we're talking about here and it is possible that she could show up in Excalibur later on but as of right now I really don't see anything foreshadowing that just as yet but so now for this Morgan Le Fay who's more of your Morgan Le Fay Prime. She resides in Camelot within Otherworld which is like the center of magic throughout Marvel kind of like their Rock of Eternity because it's from here where you have Merlin who gave Brian Braddock the choice in which to save his life with choosing the amulet or the sword to where between the amulet of right and the sword of might the amulet was life and the sword was death of which Brian chose the amulet because he didn't consider himself to be much of a warrior but after his first conflict proving victorious after taking down Joshua Strag the Reaver and after doing so at the time Braddock was said to be Britain's greatest new warrior who we would later find out would be one of many with your Captain Britain core which stretches throughout the multiverse of which was given the duty to guard the multiverse and this Captain Britain core was of course created by Merlin who many years before had taught Morgan Le Fay magic in order to prevent the fall of Camelot and so now where we jump in with Excalibur which starts off with a lot of mystery and how it starts off here with her pulling her nephew Sir Garrus to which she pulls inside the castle to show him that Camelot is being invaded by these strange weeds which have been mysterious seriously climbing their way into Camelot and this is something that Morgan Le Fay also connects to the attack from the White Witch with all of these things blitzing her kingdom at the same time and so now just for a minute just to place my big toe in the realm of speculation I'm just gonna make a guess like with everything that's going on in Marauders right now that the White Witch is Emma Frost and the quote-unquote weeds that are growing all over Camelot they're just extensions of Krakoa that she's using to do whatever she's doing which is likely more than just invading other worlds with a bunch of weeds but I just want to put that out out there could be might not be who knows and I've also given some thought to a crazy twist where it might be Roma the daughter of Merlin but I couldn't quite put any logic to it so I said I'll forget it and so for now I'm just sticking with Emma Frost but from here jumping over to Krakoa where we now have the recent arrival of Betsy Braddock who's made her way here very seamlessly from the Braddock Academy in Malden England and so now as for her I won't really get into the whole transition of her getting back into her original body because we had talked about that back in the hunt for Wolverine and I'll leave a link below if you need to check that out but I do gotta say like just seeing her like this in Dawn of X like it's good to know that that whole hunt for Wolverine and all that wasn't for nothing and I mean I would like to get a bit more cohesiveness and like looking back on that stuff we've gone so far in another direction since House of X and Powers of 10 so we're like now when I think back on the hunt for Wolverine and the return of Wolverine which okay um it almost seems like that was only for the war of realms and just a little bit of thor which continued after but we'll see if any of that comes back because if still relevant hopefully don of x will clear that up or perhaps jason aaron or donny cates may reiterate that in some form or fashion but either way back to Krakoa. when we come across apocalypse who's having this conversation with trinary around the time that betsy braddock arrives here but in this conversation she also mentions that between herself cypher and sage that they haven't been able to pass through this one specific door 
war. But it's here that Apocalypse also explains to Trinary that some things can't just be calculated or figured out, but instead they need to be discovered. But immediately he recognizes that this door leads to Otherworld, and more specifically Camelot, and in order for them to pass through here, they'll need a champion. And so now from here we jump over the Fair Green Hall, which is like the home of the Coven Solar Blackwood. And at this time, High Priestess Mariana Stern, who's here with members of her coven, fending off a number of ghosts, to where not long after they're met by a projection of Sir Garrus, who then tells them that the Queen requests to speak with them. And when Morgan Le Fay appears, she pretty much tells them that she's cutting them off from magic because of their betrayal and their threat to Camelot in the waters of Avalon. And initially, Mariana Stern, she doesn't know what Morgan Le Fay is talking about because neither her or any one of her coven would dare to attack the source of their power. But when Morgan Le Fay shows them the weeds that have been growing in the waters of Avalon, it's then immediately that they notice that these plants are from Kokoa. And when Mariana tries to make the argument that these plants belong to mutants and that these aren't the workings of any human, and this is something pretty recognizable on Earth because as of right now, Krakoa is like all over the news. But of course, Camelot doesn't get Earth news like that. So because of this, Morgan Le Fay just tells them that they need to find the source and destroy it. And she doesn't care if it came from mutants or not because the Morgan Le Fay, she just puts them all in the same category. But she tells her that they have to find the source and destroy it because she's busy defending her kingdom. And until they destroy it, Morgan Le Fay is going to cut them off from magic indefinitely, which kind of limits their means of doing so. But Mariana got it figured out. But so now jumping back to Krakoa, you also have Betsy Braddock who arrives at the hatchery at the arrival of her older brother, Jamie Braddock Jr., who's also known as Monarch. And his powers are like reality warping. And I want to say he's used magic at times, but I'm not really sure if that's still a thing. But shortly after the birth of her older brother, which sounds crazy just saying it out loud, but not long after she's met by Apocalypse, who tells her that they need the amulet from her twin brother, Brian, in order to get through this door to Camelot. And not necessarily that he has to give up the amulet, but Apocalypse needs him here so that he can use it to figure out a way to pass through this door. And so now when Betsy arrives to see her brother Brian, who she had literally left not long before, like when she arrives here and she sees him already suited up, with him being on his way to Avalon and finding out that it's an emergency, she immediately tells him that she's gonna go with them because with her just finding out about this, along with what she's heard from Apocalypse, she has reason to believe that her brother being called over there is just a trap. And essentially it is because when they arrive there, there's a couple of things that pop out pretty quickly because one, one, Morgan Le Fay considers Brian Braddock to be an oath breaker because essentially through the amulet, the source of his power, he is sworn to be loyal to Merlin. And now that Morgan Le Fay has become Queen Regent, that oath and that loyalty has been passed to her. And from her perspective, he hasn't been doing a good job at protecting Camelot. And as far as his twin sister, Betsy, who's a mutant, to whom other worlders consider to be witch bred, Morgan Le Fay now directly sees Betsy as an enemy because she's recently discovered that the mutants, aka the witch bred, they are the source of this strange weed which has been growing within the waters of Avalon. So what Morgan Le Fay immediately does is she takes Brian Braddock reclaiming him as her knight and at the last minute when this happens Brian passes his amulet to Betsy and so now while this is happening back in Krakoa with Apocalypse who's been studying this door and also keeping an eye on Betsy Braddock but at this point in time he's also called for Rogue to absorb some of the magic from this door in order to weaken it but also while this is happening on the other side Apocalypse has made a connection to Betsy to where at the same time that Rogue is reaching for the door Apocalypse tells Betsy to disrupt it which in a way it's kind of dirty on Apocalypse part because on neither side is he given everybody all of the information but it's almost like he's in a group chat telling two people to jump through the same door at the same time but i guess in his defense like when he's telling betsy to disrupt the door at the same time that he's telling rogue to drain some of his magic it's almost like okay he has a plan that he needs them to execute and if they're strong enough cool and if not okay like to him that's also cool but also just to be clear this was a plan that gambit hated from the jump because from here when rogue is turned into sleeping beauty gambit immediately runs up on apocalypse and i mean it's like gambit did tell apocalypse like if anything happens to rogue that he's gonna kick his butt and at the time apocalypse was like you know i would like to see you try because it's like really like really you gonna really like i wouldn't have minded that conversation would have went on for like a few more panels like imagine Apocalypse just making an announcement to the whole island of Krakoa like attention mutants of Krakoa Gambit said he gonna whoop my head and then the whole island just bust out laughing and like what he gonna do hit him with that joker joker deuce deuce <laughs> probably not but with the turn of events Betsy Braddock has made her way out as a new Captain Britain and at this point in time she's not even sure exactly what has happened to Rogue in the middle of this process but from here jumping back over to Mariana Stern who has pretty much sacrificed her whole coven and with doing so switched over to 
the coven Akaba, which is the coven that's tied to Apocalypse and his blood descendants, because it's like Mariana, she's figured that, okay, Morgan Le Fay has cut her off from magic, so now it's sacrificing her coven and going over to the coven Akaba, who are also former servants of Apocalypse, who he later rejected after they devoted their lives to him, but he had mainly did so because this coven believed that their power was on par with mutants, which caused Apocalypse to be like, look, you miss me with all that. But so for Mariana Stern, this appears to be her attempt to ally herself with a power that could buy against them. But after this, we go back to Betsy, Gambit, and Jubilee, who hitch a ride with Kate Pride in order to get to the Braddock Lighthouse in hopes that it'll have a solution in order to fix what's going on the road. But on their way in search of this lighthouse, their ship is attacked by a group of Selkies, who are like these seal people, who if I'm not mistaken, they go back to like the early history of Camelot, like before its location in Otherworld, and even before the fall of Atlantis. But also when I see this, I can't help but to think, like, I took a friend of mine to the aquarium, and like while we were there, her and I went on this tour, and they group you up with people on this tour. And so when our group got to the seals, our guide had asked us, does anyone here know what sound a seal makes? And just about before our guide could finish her sentence, like this dude, this grown man in the back was like, er, er, er. and we just looked down like, bro, you a grown man? Like, what are you doing? And it's like, I don't mean to judge, but I'm, I'm judging just a little bit. <laughs> but either way, uh, what was I at? Oh yeah, the group of Selkies. But so now while they're attacked by them, Betsy realizes that they're mainly coming after her. And it's for this reason she jumps off the boat and lures them towards the land, because once she gets on the land, they can't follow her on the dry surface. And immediately Gambit thinks this is like an effort to ditch Rogue and just run for it, or swim for it, then run for it. But Betsy has that covered so that Gambit and Jubilee can also make it to land, and Kitty Pride can just go back to maraudering. But even now still with it getting dark, they still see no sign of this lighthouse. But not long after during their search, Betsy spots a group of people in these green cloaks who only she can see, like Gambit and Rogue don't know who or what she's talking to. But this group of people who are known as the Druids, they recognize Betsy as a seer since she can in fact see them and hear them. And when she approaches them, they inform her of Mariana and what she's up to, with her powers from Morgan Le Fay waning and her swearing a new loyalty to a group who rejects mutant descendancy. But as far as the Druids, they're on Kate's side. They're on the side of the mutants and they're on the side of Krakoa because they believe that the mutants will protect them from the dangers that's to come and it's also why they're willing to share portions of England with the mutants and Krakoa because of this belief but in addition to this we also get a bit more history about this location and like a bit of reference to Apocalypse and his history with the Druids and when we get this flashback to a point in time when Apocalypse was associated with the Akaba which was also a time when Apocalypse was considered to be the first of its kind like during this time a couple of Druids who were mutants who were also like twin brother and sister but when Apocalypse had encountered them here in England and in the fourth century BCE they were being exiled because they were mutants and when Apocalypse seen this being the warm hearted person that he is he just watched them die and he's like you know what I'm gonna put a pin in this location and I'm gonna remember where this happened and that's really just one of the things about Apocalypse because now like centuries later I mean he's he's worked on it but even with us seeing these gradual changes in him I believe there's a lot of old Apocalypse that's not going anywhere because back at the time when he allowed the two mutant druids to drown in the water and we don't know for certain that they're dead we may run into them later on down down the line and that's something that's just possible but the reason that apocalypse did not assist them is because one of his main rules is that he doesn't help others who cause themselves harm by their own means which an argument could be made for that that's pretty much everybody but in the case of betsy and the others after getting this vision from the druids of whom that she can only see it's then that the roots which were surrounding rogue they grow into a light tower pushing rogue all the way to the top to where at the top rogue started to glow even brighter becoming the light for that lighthouse and though betsy and the others didn't fully understand this as the reader we're informed that this was a combination of a couple things with one being the science and wonders of Kokoa but in addition to that especially here in England there are certain magics that permit certain things to happen so after the attack on the previous lighthouse this one growing here was like the druids giving Betsy their blessing but so after they go inside and just try to get a little sleep, Jubilee has a nightmare about Apocalypse just babysitting Shogo. And all he was doing in the dream was holding the baby. But it was enough to spook her to go get her child. So she rushes in the middle of the night to the closest gate to go back to Krakoa and bring Shogo here. And so now for Betsy, while she's sleeping, she has this dream or vision that's like a sign of her affirming that she accepts her call as a protector to where in addition to this, she sees Apocalypse in her dream as well. And she's shown a sign as well that says he will use us, so we will also use him. And so now not long after this, to where at this time, Jubilee has already gone and gotten Shogo and the Druids then arrive, telling Betsy that they recognize her as Captain Britain and how important it is that she stands with them and protect them from the Akaba, who in the middle of this conversation immediately show up and make their attempt 
to destroy this new lighthouse, much like they did the previous one. And when this happens, Apocalypse chimes in and he's kind of like, I see what you're doing and it's cute, um, but if you want your brother to live out there in other world, then you gotta go get him. And so now for Betsy, who's like struggling to fight all these people off, she lets Apocalypse know that she cannot leave this lighthouse unguarded. So Apocalypse at that point, he's just like, okay, hold my beer. <laughs> because at this point, he's just like, okay, these guys are nothing. Let me just get them out the way real quick. And even though Betsy's just like, don't help me, I can do this. Apocalypse just waves his hand and it's over. And like what was a battle for Captain Britain was just like a high five for Apocalypse. And even around this time, Betsy, she asks Apocalypse, like, is he involved with the gates and everything showing up in Camelot? And he doesn't really give her a direct answer. He just really tells her that there's a spark to a cleansing flame. But in addition to her heading out there, Apocalypse assures her that he'll guard the lighthouse. And of course, Gambit doesn't want to go because Rogue is the light of that lighthouse. But Betsy insists that Gambit goes with her to Otherworld because she needs him fighting by her side. And as far as Jubilee, who's definitely going, but before she goes, she's like, I need to take Shogo back to Krakoa first. But before she even gets the opportunity to do so, Shogo just disappears. And before you know it, they're in Otherworld and Shogo's a dragon because it's magic. Alright, so just picking up right where we left off, to where upon their arrival in Otherworld, to where just before passing through, Shogo disappeared, and when Jubilee, Betsy, and Gambit appeared in Otherworld, like boom, Shogo was a dragon. And though we're not given the vivid explanation just yet, but with Psylocke, we do have this case to where with her telepathy, she's able to communicate better with Shogo, and use that to better relay the messages which Shogo is trying to say. And it's something that really comes in handy, because along with this, Betsy's also able to see through Shogo's eyes as he flies around Otherworld, which is something that comes in handy pretty quickly because early on she uses it to see through Shogo's eyes and when doing so when he flies over Camelot she attempts to find her brother but she doesn't necessarily see him because Shogo was just the baby flying through as a dragon and so it's not like he's exactly find my iPhone or anything like that but when this happens Shogo did fly over Morgan Le Fay's tower in Camelot to where at the time she's talking to Mariana who's working for her in Earthrealm while Morgan Le Fay is in Otherworld and with Morgan Le Fay when she reaches out to Mariana and Mariana gives her the report that she believes to know who who's behind all of this as far as the weeds that have been growing throughout Camelot to whom Mariana believes to be Apocalypse. And Morgan Le Fay is just like, okay, cool, just bring me his head. But what Morgan Le Fay is probably not really aware of is that that may be a problem with like the way his neck's set up. So it might be a little hard to get through all that and bring the whole head over there. And I mean, like, ain't like I'm scared of nothing or I couldn't do it, it's just gonna be a lot of work. And not to mention like in Mariana's case, like this is Apocalypse. His weaknesses are celestially bionic and his mutant powers have mutant powers. And so like, Rather than bring you his head, why don't she just do something easy like just dance on the water and not get wet? Because for her, that would be a more feasible request. But as far as getting back to where Shogo returned to the others, Betsy and Gambit had gotten into it as far as what their next move would be, with Gambit's main concern being Rogue and Betsy, of course, trying to get her brother back. And I gotta say, like in this case, Betsy is completely right. Because even though Gambit is concerned about Rogue, they still need to keep in mind that Rogue is a mutant. And as far as priorities go, her brother Brian, and even Shogo for that matter, with them not being mutants they don't have like the guarantee that the others have as far as being brought back from death and of course a number of things are possible and there are loopholes in certain situations which we'll talk about more later but even still with that overall the general rule is like humans are at a much higher risk of a permanent dirt nap versus anyone who's a mutant and with the way things are like that's just a valid point and it's for that reason as it is now rescuing brian and keeping shogo safe like those have kept the top priority which is why when they get the camelot they kind of do the dragon base jump in order to keep Shogo at a distance but even with doing so they kind of realized that they left their big gun and just kind of flying around doing laps and I imagine like when they got closer to the ground it was like oh that's a lot of people and so fairly quickly Jubilee and Betsy is like okay we need to call the dragon and right after that they call Shogo right back down there and when she did this it was like in a very green ranger calling the dragon zord type of thing but instead of the dragon zord showing up it goes from ABC family to HBO real quick but with this happening, like they really needed Shogo to get back involved, mainly because Betsy was not able to control Morgan Le Fay's army, but instead she was just restricted to seeing like a small percentage of their surface thoughts, which is how she even knew that her brother was there as well, and not like taking her moved elsewhere. But even still, shortly after this, they're met with the arrival of Brian still under Morgan Le Fay's influence. But also keep in mind, like even if this wasn't the case, she still wouldn't have been able to read his mind. And this is one of the things like with them being twins, to where between the two of them, there's always been this connection 
connection, but there's like this block at the same time. And this is something that's always been there. Because if I'm not mistaken, like the way it works is like she can't read his mind or she's never been able to use her telepathy on him. But I know for certain there's been cases to where one of them has been badly injured and the other can sense or feel it. And I really feel like we got a bit of both here. Because with Betsy not being able to use her telepathy to track down Brian, but instead finding him by sensing him through the people around him. But even with that, because they can sense each other's pain, when they fought, there was like a moment where she was able to get through to him. But as soon as this happened and Shogo came to help out, Morgan Le Fay just pulled him away. And I really believe that's why she had got a glimpse of him coming back just in that brief moment. Because in addition to this, when they first arrived in Otherworld, or just not long before they made their way over here, Brian was able to sense his sister reaching out for him and trying to find him. And so that connection slash block thing that they got going is like the only answer I got for that. But when we get back over to Apocalypse, who's really come to the point to where he's figured that the magic within these stones, which can only open a gate to Otherworld for a short period of time, before their magic is completely depleted, it's then that he realizes that he needs to find something or someone that won't deplete, who is also a master of stones, so that they'll be able to sustain specifically what he needs them to do. But it's here, where Apocalypse goes through this gate to find this mutant, and he just strolls through the park like making my way downtown. Really thick neck, gold on deck, I'm Apocalypse. <laughs> but could you imagine Apocalypse doing like the da 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 and I miss you <laughs> as he just strolls through the park? <laughs> like, what, you can't see it? Okay, alright, never mind. <laughs> I digress. But as it turns out, we come to find out that he's here to get Richter. And really, like, at the end of the day, who better? Avalanche? No. And it's not that I have anything against him, but he's not as powerful as Richter. Two, he doesn't have as many powers as Richter, which is really enough in itself because Apocalypse ain't really the type to run around looking for number two. But really for Richter, who at this point has lost control of his powers, and because of that he's locked himself in his apartment and like shut himself inside of this box in order to protect others from him. But when Apocalypse gets there and he rips the top off of this box, I can't really tell if Richter is just afraid that somebody came in his house or he's afraid that Apocalypse just rolled up on him unannounced. Could be a bit of both. But when he shows up here to get Richter, Richter tries to explain to him that he doesn't have control over his power and he's been afraid to go to Krakoa because he doesn't want to step through that portal and just break Krakoa into pieces like a cookie. And Apocalypse just more or less tells him like, ain't no cookie you can break that I can't rebake. Let's go. And if you think about it, like if it did just get to the point where Richter got out of hand, Apocalypse would probably just get big and pick him up. And then boom, problem solved. But with Richter, when he goes with Apocalypse and they make their way to England, which is where Apocalypse had been working from since Betsy and the others had left, but it's shortly after that we find out that the British secret intelligence has been looking for Captain Britain. And this we find out by way of MI-13, Pete Wisdom. And really, he's somebody we haven't seen in a minute. But in his case, he's caught up with everything. He knows that Betsy is Captain Britain now, but even with that this guy goes way back because like with new excalibur he was part of the whole reformation of that team after house of m with him being one of the few mutants who kept their powers after scarlet witch had said mutants no more but not long after when Gambit and the others came back from Otherworld, and when they get back, of course, the first thing that Gambit does is check on Rogue. But even with doing so, he doesn't stay here long, because at this point, there's really nothing that he could do. And for that reason, he ends up agreeing to go with Betsy and Pete Wisdom, for Betsy to meet up with the Queen herself, which is originally why Pete had came out there looking for her. And the main reason that Betsy had to come here, it's because with her being the active Captain Britain, it not only became her responsibility to handle these otherworldly matters, but with Captain Britain being a servant to the crown, she also has to report to the queen and inform her of who she's working with, who's helping her out, to where in this case she officially tells her that the name of her team is Excalibur. But even when they go there, there's a number of people like protesting outside, and though there are some who just want to see the new Captain Britain, you also have others who just hate mutants, but even with that, Gambit ain't got no time for it. And in this case, it's like one thing for them to be yelling and holding up signs, but like when a dude throws a bottle, Gambit throws it back with a little charge on it, and he starts blowing of their signs, which is mainly in self-defense, but also with Gambit, he's kind of on a short fuse because of the whole situation with Rogue, and because of that, it doesn't take much for him to go off, which really isn't a good look for people who just didn't see the whole thing. But essentially, this meeting doesn't take too long, and Betsy comes back out, and she explains all this to Gambit, Richter, and the rest of the crew, and with this, she lets them know that not just herself, but all of them are accountable to the Queen. And so when they meet with Apocalypse to fill him in, and with this, he very much understands that Captain Britain has her duties, 
Apocalypse, but even with this, Gambit expresses that his main concern is Rogue, and Apocalypse agrees. And with that, it's here that they essentially split up into two teams, with Betsy and Pete Wisdom handling the Queen's concerns with Coven Akaba. <laughs> but as far as the second team, the others who Apocalypse would need in order to help out Rogue, as it turns out, they have to take something from deep within the Earth, so to do so, they need a Master of Earth and a Master Thief, which makes it pretty clear really quick that he's talking about Richter and Gambit. But when we find out what Apocalypse actually sent them to go get, it's something that plays out in a pretty cool way. Because essentially, with him sending Gambit and Richter to go get more of the stones, which are actually made from the bones of like really old mutants, to where we find out these stones contain their energy, which is what Apocalypse has been using. But once again, when he uses them they deplete quick which is why we know apocalypse went to go get richter but in a way it's also why he sent richter here with gambit to get these stones or these stone bones but even with this it didn't take them long to figure out why gambit was also here like why they needed a thief with these stones belonging to the druids who live here in these caves and have been guarding these stones for years but on top of that, when they see Richter and they see that he can actually control the terrain, much like how they can, this is where it switches up. Because for the druids who first don't really trust anybody who's trespassing within their caves, let alone someone who's come there to steal these stones, of which they kind of give us this inkling that Gambit and Richter aren't the first. And I mean, there's that in all these bones lying around here and there. But the thing is, like when they make their way to what appears to be this vault where a bunch of these stones are kept, and it's then that the druids catch up with them and more or less keep them from getting crushed while in there but it's here that they recognize Richter's abilities and when they ask him has he been able to do this since birth and he's like well more or less then they're just like oh you're one of us and much like we had seen when they had cooperated with Betsy Braddock with them having a mutual enemy in the Akaba it's for that reason that they actually help Richter here and give him the stones that he needs because really the ones that they were taking when they got in the vault they were empty like their power had already been depleted and had they taken those back to Apocalypse they would have been no good and actually all the other stones that were there in the vault they were just a distraction for thieves of whom they really don't take a liking to and because of the way that they see it like Richter he has a right to get one of the stones but for Gambit he's considered just to be a trespasser and a thief and when they essentially try to kill Gambit for attempting to steal some of these stones Richter tries to use his power to help Gambit but even still he doesn't have it all the way under control but with Gambit falling to his death and Richter not being able to use his powers precisely enough to save him he then uses some of the power from the stone and even with doing so being careful not to use too much but with doing this he was able to to save Gambit and likely because he was never told just yet about the whole mutant resurrection program because even still he hasn't been to Krakoa just yet but in the case of Pete and Betsy who go to meet with Reuben and Mariana and with doing so it was supposed to be like Pete was bringing Betsy here as a representative of the Queen as shield to the throne and she was supposed to find a peaceful resolve with the Akaba but as it turns out that's not why the Akaba wanted her here but instead as it turns out her being called to meet here was only a distraction because when they were in Otherworld to where the barriers of its reality they're so fragile that they can be broken with Dragonfire as it turned out Shogo's Dragonfire actually made it weak enough for it to tear right through and so now when this happens it really flips things on its head because when Betsy and Pete discover this she lets him know that she immediately has to get back to the lighthouse and it's not just to what it means for her and her family but it's also this case of helping Apocalypse who at one point needed power to open this door but now it's like he needs that same power to close it and for Pete who's like yeah I'm totally listening so let's go back to my flat which Betsy admits sounds like a weird offer especially at this moment in time with everything going crazy but as it turned out when they got in there he showed her that it has the perfect view of the closest gate so that this way she can get back to the others as quick as possible because why else would he ask her to come up there but she definitely takes this opportunity to get back to apocalypse and the others because like with Apocalypse, there's a few things going on here. Because one, he was definitely waiting on the stones which he had sent Richter and Gambit to go steal for him so he can use them against Morgan Le Fay. But with this unexpected breach which was caused by Shogo, this then kicked things off a lot earlier than what Apocalypse had expected. And it's really at this point in time where a lot of these things get revealed, which even still I believe is like the tip of the iceberg. Because in addition to this, we then get our confirmation that Apocalypse this whole time, he's been keeping Rogue suppressed, mainly 
only because he had a specific time that he needed her to awaken and really this whole time he had just been stalling for like this specific alignment between the X gene, the sun and the moon, which is ultimately this concept of magic which claims that sapiens with the X gene, better known as mutants, that they're designed to be the more powerful magic wielders, which is a pretty crazy concept, but Gambit and Richter, like they totally messed this whole thing up. And how did they mess it up? I'm glad you asked, because Gambit for one, of course you know that he wants to get Rogue out of this sleeping beauty state. So to do so, what he ended up doing was asking someone to go inside of Rogue's mind and kind of help guide her out of there. Who I believe at the time was Rachel Summers, who appeared to Rogue like in her mind as like this Phoenix Wolf thing, but with doing this in Rogue's mind and literally having her going Rogue, but there's a reason that Apocalypse wanted Rogue in this dreamlike place, which I'll talk about more in a little bit. But when Apocalypse found this out, he was pissed. When Gambit told him and spilled the whole plan like, yeah, this is what I did. Apocalypse was like, I will bury you. <laughs> and like he hit Gambit so hard like I'm surprised Gambit didn't just wake up on the next page in a birthing pod and just wake up like man like how did I die <laughs> and when he wakes up Charles is just like oh yeah Apocalypse punched you welcome back but no really at this point with Gambit knocked out and Apocalypse then tries to use the stones which have insufficient funds on them and because of that he then gets mad at Richter who does admit that he used some of the power to save Gambit before but at the same time it's like you can't really blame Richter because he hasn't been told or explained to about everything that's going on necessarily and it's like when Apocalypse tells Richter that these are ancient bones and the power that's in them it's finite and once that power is spent it's just spent and at that point Richter was like man well dang I just thought they were stones but even with that we do know that Richter can sense that they were more than stones because he had picked that up originally when they had entered the cave but at this point in time for Apocalypse it's like this circumstance is like almost the perfect opportunity with the tear between the lighthouse and other world happening before he expected but if he had had the sufficient stones he would then be able to do what he needed to do which then had him looking at Gambit for another way to make this happen but at this point that's when Rogue came back and all she had seen was Gambit not moving with Apocalypse over his body and really for all she knew he was dead and when she comes back she is beating the mess out of Apocalypse and for Apocalypse like that's when the light bulb goes off because for this ritual to be complete he needed Rogue to cross over into that place in between where our world and other world meet and with Rogue absorbing the power from that gate she was like the only one who could make that happen and in this moment here with them needing bones that are like 10,000 years old or perhaps even older Apocalypse then tells her to not let go because with him dying here that'll then be the last piece to make the ritual complete but as far as the alignment with like the sun and moon and becoming like the ultimate magic wielder like that's gonna have to wait for another day but in the case of having rogue actually here and apocalypse sacrificing himself by allowing her to kill him this completed the ritual to where they can cross into other world when they want and in the case of rogue who absorbed much of apocalypse power and a bit of his temper which we'll see later on like she ends up looking pretty badass but in addition to this she had also seen the thoughts of apocalypse and at least to the point of where now she knows that the reason that he'd want this door open it was mainly because he has plans for taking the throne of morgan le fay but there's so much more to it than that because man but we'll get to it in the next one Alright, so in our last talk with Apocalypse running into the issue of not having a suitable power source to create access to this doorway which would allow him to enter Otherworld whenever he wanted and also shut off all those creatures that had made their way through. But with running into this issue and Rogue wanting to kill him anyway, it turned out to be the resolution for everything because now they have the door that works and all the creatures have been sent back. And so now as in the case of Apocalypse and his resurrection, it's here that we find out that there's a bit of a high priority system that's set in place for the members of the quiet council because after rogue kills them they bring him right back and of course charles restores his memories and apocalypse is fully back but even still with this with xavier there's a bit of this frustration if you will because in a way he kind of feels like apocalypse is abusing the system with him intentionally dying but even with this concern there's no like charles getting into it with apocalypse or charles trying to hash it out with him he really just goes through the motions of bringing apocalypse back and it's from there that apocalypse just continues back where he left off and 
And something important on top of that is that when Apocalypse comes back, he's met immediately by Jamie Braddock, who usually isn't welcome here because how his powers disrupt the resurrection process, but even still he arrives immediately because there is much more work to be done. And one of the crazy things about this as well, which probably leans into some of the concerns of Charles Xavier, but it's like when we jump back in and we see Apocalypse being resurrected, and then we go back over to Otherworld and we see that huge blast come through hitting Camelot, which of course was a result of Apocalypse's death, it almost makes you think like, man, like how fast was that resurrection set up? Because essentially Apocalypse could have sent a message to Charles Xavier, kind of like, man, warm the pods up, man, I'm about to come through, to kind of fast track the preparation like just before he died because prior to this point we've seen him do that to other members of Excalibur as far as projecting his thoughts and giving them directions and instructions so it's likely he may have done the same with Charles just to skip to the front of the line so that he could get back out there with Excalibur as quickly as possible and though we don't get it explained that thoroughly I do believe like that's the reasoning behind Charles Xavier feeling some type of way about Apocalypse abusing the resurrection priority system but with Apocalypse making haste to get back out here it wasn't like he was rushing out here to help them out and he expresses that to Betty right away who's mainly concerned about them being outnumbered but it's funny because the response of Apocalypse is like you being outnumbered is the last thing I'm worried about because anything getting thrown at you guys for the time being like Rogue got it covered and really during this time where Apocalypse was gone like she really did because essentially she was Apocalypse and Rogue in a two for one on the battlefield holding it down like a champ but also with Betsy expressing her concern with there being more soldiers coming on top of what they're dealing with it's here that Apocalypse expresses that he has that covered as well because at this point in time he wants to speak to Morgan directly and rather than continue this war place a wager that'll resolve everything and with doing so he insists that they have a duel to the death between their selected champions to where he chooses Betsy knowing that Morgan would choose Brian and when it comes to this point you can tell that this is something that Apocalypse has thought out for some time because when Morgan agrees to this it's almost like she's accepting an offer that she couldn't refuse especially with Apocalypse mentioning about mutant resurrections and that if Betsy he dies she'll be brought back but in the case of Brian not so much having that luxury he'll be fighting for his life which more so have Morgan feeling like he'll fight harder and he'll win the duel but here's the thing because as soon as it gets started Apocalypse he starts walking around and setting up things like he goes to Jubilee and he tells her hey get Shoko ready when I tell you I need some fire I'm gonna let you know I'm gonna give you the cue and of course you know Jubilee is gonna be like well I thought fire was a bad thing because that's how we got into the problem just before this but of course with Apocalypse who has his plan set in motion he's like you know don't worry about that I got something for that just, just do what I say when I'm ready and like to me like had I been Morgan Le Fay like in this moment when you have a bet going with Apocalypse duel versus duel champion versus champion and immediately when the duel begins he starts going around talking to people looking this way pointing that way like I would have been like hey where you going where you going hey why you talking to them what you talking about hey don't do that don't do that what's that like I would have been super skeptical and it comes to a point within their battle where they scuffle over their sword and Brian lands right on top of of it killing him and when this happens apocalypse is conveniently standing next to jamie braddock and i'm telling you man like had he been in vegas they'd have been like hold up real quick we need to check the camera footage like something just ain't right but as soon as brian's killed apocalypse then gives the word to jubilee to get shogo to spill fire and apocalypse is already moving to the next step he just steps to morgan he's like all right boom your place is on fire you lost get your stuff let's go <laughs> but no really he tells her okay well things have shifted around here now that you lost and effective immediately you gotta bow to your new king Jamie Braddock and along with this agreement like Apocalypse promised Morgan exile but the thing is the exile gonna be here and we'll see the reasoning with that later on because every little thing that Apocalypse is doing here like all the pieces each and every one of them has their reasoning and of course immediately like after this is done Betsy isn't necessarily happy about her brother Jamie being the new king but even with that being so this still is her brother and she firmly puts her foot down for him to bring back their other brother who was just killed and Jamie was just gonna sit there like okay wasn't nothing happened but of course Jamie brings back Brian which has its other consequences which we'll see later on but right after this when we get a bit of Betsy questioning Apocalypse for making Jamie the king like when Apocalypse responds to this he gives her a bit of a logical answer and it's not like Apocalypse needs to explain himself to Betsy but this is one of those examples early on of one of those things to where Apocalypse he really does want Betsy to trust him and it's for that reason that he does communicate to her in times like this but the reasoning that apocalypse gives betsy which is pretty much falls into the same 
same thing that I mentioned with Jamie being perfect to rule Avalon, it's because Otherworld is a place that's constantly changing, it's a fragile reality, it's unstable, and who better to have here in your pocket than somebody who can manipulate matter who doesn't share the same weaknesses as this realm, with the most recent example of that being Dragonfire. But as far as what I was speaking of before, with there being consequences along with Brian's resurrection, because later when they get back to Earth Realm and return back to Braddock Manor, Brian tells Betsy that he was visited again by Merlin and Roma, and given the decision between the Amulet of Right and the Sword of Might, much like when he had first became Captain Britain, just that this time he chose the sword instead of the amulet. And he expresses that he believes that the reason why he had made this different decision this time around, it was because that innocence which he had before when he chose the amulet, he believed believes that part of him died when he was under the control of Morgan Le Fay. And when he died in this form and came back, he still feels like that part is gone, even though he's no longer under Morgan's control. But here's the thing, because even still with him accepting the sword from Merlin and Roma, he's still given the powers which come along with it. But even still with doing so, his loyalties lay with Merlin and Roma. But with Betsy being the new Captain Britain and being the wielder of the amulet to whom they didn't select, it isn't but a matter of time before they will turn Brian against her to reclaim what they believe to be theirs. And it's because of this that Brian requests that Betsy takes the Sword of Might far away from him so that they'll never come to this. And with doing so, Brian likely just having the fear that he'll be controlled by Merlin, much like he was with Morgan, and really just coming to the resolve that hopefully if he just keeps the sword away, then he'll never be commissioned to carry out that task. But from here, jumping back over to Otherworld, to where at this time, things are a bit simpler, because now you really just have King Jamie of Avalon versus the forces of your White Witch, which don't seem to be much of a problem to Jamie because once again, Omega Level Mutant and Reality Warper. So essentially there's that. But it's around this time where we see him go to give Apocalypse an update about the White Witch, to where Jamie walks in on Apocalypse doing this living autopsy on Morgan Le Fay, to where I could just imagine Jamie walked in and just like, like for a moment was just like what the hell is going on in here but you can tell that apocalypse didn't necessarily want jamie walking in on this and even though he has it's not necessarily like it's a huge problem but as it turns out we discover that apocalypse is studying morgan Le Fay and recording in his grimoire the genealogy of a witch in relation to magic and mapping it out much like the information on a mutant and their genealogy in relation to the mutant powers and it's really one of those things that just harkens back to what we had discovered about Apocalypse and why he had kept Rogue locked away in that space between Earth and Otherworld when we had got a glimpse into his plans of wanting to upgrade into like this ultimate mutant magic wielder, which of course was a plan that he had to throw on the back burner with Rogue getting out and him having to settle for just being able to open a door to Otherworld at any given time. But with Rogue getting out and prolonging that plan, we know at this point that it is still something that he's working on and whether or not he still may need Rogue in that in-between realm with the stars aligning and all that other crazy stuff, that we have yet still to see, but with what he's doing now with Morgan Le Fay, it seems like he has the same goal in mind, but this time he's taking the more practical approach, or maybe just doing more research on how to do it again. Alright, so jumping right back in, we see like what's the resolve for now with the situation with Brian Braddock who was approached by Merlin and Roma not long after leaving Otherworld to where he was tested again but this time he chose the Sword of Might. But with him knowing that he made this different decision, choosing the sword over the amulet, he knew it was a product of him being different after being under the control of Morgan Le Fay, which is why he didn't want to wield the sword. So with doing so, he gave it to Betsy and told her to find a way to keep it away from him. Because also if he had continued to wield it, it's like likely that either Merlin or Roma would eventually have him go against his sister Betsy, either sooner or later, being that she's the acting Captain Britain, even though she wasn't chosen by them. So essentially with Richter's help, she puts the sword in the stone, which was one of those things that kind of had me like, okay, I see what you did there. But with doing this and also having Richter's help to cover it up, this was like your immediate solution to help Brian Braddock for the time being. But even after this, Betsy had some issues that she needed to sort out with Apocalypse, in addition to keeping an eye on her other brother Jamie, to whom being the king of Avalon is not a small thing, but to him he believes he's king of Otherworld altogether. But even with him being king of Avalon and Betsy being Captain Britain, they still communicate like brother and sister. So when she asks him like where's Apocalypse, he just opens up the ground and lets her fall through to where he's at. And he knows she'll be fine because she's Captain Britain, but even still with them taking shots at each other, it's very true to their relationship which to be honest at this point in time is probably the best that I've seen it between the two of them. But when Betsy arrives here at the library to speak to Apocalypse, 
and Exodus is just chilling there like, what up? But really and truly, it makes sense that Exodus is even here because him and Apocalypse go way back and not even like it's always been on the best of terms with Apocalypse finding him and boosting his powers, but then later on locking him in a crypt and sealing it with a curse. So they've kind of had their back and forth. But in the grand scope of where everything is right now, it makes sense that Exodus would assist Apocalypse or even Magneto for that matter in current day Krakoan affairs. But as far as what we know right now, aside from Exodus being on the Quiet Council and also in a separate group from Magneto and Apocalypse that at this point in time he's also helping Apocalypse to some extent but we probably won't see how that pans out till much later but when Betsy arrives here and she expresses her concern to Apocalypse and mainly for her suspicion of the obscure things that Apocalypse has been having Excalibur doing he first reminds her that Krakoa is his home as well and as a member of the Quiet Council anything that he suggests or requests is for the betterment of that country but in addition to this to give her a bit more peace of mind he shares with her pages of his grimoire so that she'll know more specifically what he's been up to and what he's been doing. But even with him doing this, I feel like this isn't even like the full script. Like this is the version that Tom Holland gets before doing a press junket. Because I'm pretty sure when we get into the true reason of why Apocalypse is seeking the mastery of magic, or better yet the mastery of mutant magic, that some of his details may be on a need to know basis. Because if they weren't, then he'd be doing living autopsies in the front yard. Well, okay, maybe not in the front yard, but more people would know. But after sharing his grimoire with Betsy, this does give her a bit more of a peace of mind, but immediately after he gets into his next request. Because in the grand scope, time isn't necessarily a luxury that he has. But for his next request, he asks for the heads of five war wolves, which are needed for his next spell. Because right now with them opening their doors to Otherworld, they do still have the issue of anyone else being able to get through, which also presents the need for a tracking beacon between realms. And when Betsy's like, what does all this mean? He just tells her, read the grimoires, it's in there. And <laughs> so at least that way she has a way to catch up on the rest of those details. But real quick, just to give you guys a bit of a better understanding on what war wolves are, where they came from, and what they're capable of doing, first I will say much of their origins and history is a mystery. And our first introduction to them was like in Excalibur issue 1 in the late 80s where we later discovered that they were sent from the Mojo verse. but even then we were shown that these aren't kind creatures. They're part human and part lupine, they're literally skin crawlers, so when they attack they dissolve your insides and then reshape themselves to fit inside your skin. But aside from even reshaping themselves to fit within someone's skin, they can also mimic their voice, their mannerisms, and much like we've seen with Rachel Summers, they can even block telepathy. But back at the time, not long after escaping the Mojoverse, when Excalibur had defeated the war wolves who had followed them back, they were later placed in the London Zoo, which is essentially where Betsy is heading at this time to retrieve what Apocalypse had asked for. But fast forward to now, when they get there, they're all gone. And the lady who worked there, like she didn't really want to cooperate and tell them where they had went, but that that really didn't matter because when Pete Wisdom was talking to her, Jubilee was hacking in their system and just downloading the information they needed anyway. And as it turns out, the War Wolves were actually recently bought from the zoo to a private owner, to whom right after, they immediately went to go see because Pete Wisdom's an agent and he admits that the government watches everything and he's using his perks to kind of help them out. And this is what leads them to tracking down Cullen Bloodstone, who's the son of the late Ulysses Bloodstone, but his family's pretty much famous for being like the world's best monster hunters. And I'd really say more so his father Ulysses and his sister Elsa, but the monster hunting thing, it really is legendary in their family because first, their father, with him discovering the blood gem, which not only helped him to combat monsters, but also gave him a number of abilities, like enhanced speed and strength, allowed him to live for thousands of years, but we'll get back to more about him in a little bit. Because I don't think we've talked much about the Bloodstone family, and the only time I can remember us talking about the blood gem, it was like years ago when we were talking about Dokken and Wolverine versus the Punisher. So we'll talk a bit more about the Bloodstone family in a little bit. But with them seeking out Cullen Bloodstone and asking him, first of all, why would you buy a ton of war wolves? Like, what would you possibly want with those things in a domestic setting? Like, hey guys, it's my pet war wolf, but don't worry, he don't bite. Like, mm, I don't know. Like, I don't trust that. But as we come to find out, he's very open about what he's doing with taking them to his family summer lodge in order to destroy them, but to him doing this in the way of a sport. And with hearing this, Pete Wisdom's like, okay, cool. Well, if you want to kill him anyway, well, let us just get the heads and we'll be on our way. But with Cullen being a purist in the sport of hunting, he lets them know that if they want the heads, then they would need to come to his summer lodge in England and hunt for the war wolves themselves. But also with doing this, we come to find out that he does also have like his set of rules when it comes to hunting and what he considers to be quote fair game because with him not liking mutants so much he's prohibited Krakoan gates or any Krakoan flora for that matter from being on the premises of his lodge or involved with any of the hunting activities 
but also when Cullen starts the hunt and everyone else from Excalibur makes their way out to the field, they start to have a bit of this conversation to where Gambit points out how it's kind of weird that the council has them doing this crazy hunt, and Richter's like, really, it's not the council, it's just Apocalypse, which even pisses off Gambit even more because he already still feels some type of way about how Apocalypse had used Rogue and the potential danger or even suffering that Apocalypse carelessness could have put on her. And for Gambit, knowing that little bit of information now, it just didn't help. But also while they're out here and they find a girl in the field who's just sitting there by herself, appearing to be either lost or stranded, but when Gambit goes to see if she needs help, it then turns out that she's a war wolf. And what's pretty crazy, like on top of this, like prior to this point, because there was a bit of this debate on whether they're actually sentient or more so if they had like the higher knowledge, which would lean more towards the human nature and wondering with this if they had enough of a capacity to be reasoned with, like if they had the mental capacity just to prove that they weren't complete animals. But after seeing this thing jump out this little girl's skin, it's like real quick that no longer becomes the conversation. But with them hunting the others in Rogue using her flight, Richter, he's filling out the terrain to track where they're hiding, and of course Gambit who was first to bust some cards at the first one. Like it caught him off guard so that was a reflex. But with seeing this Cullen quickly felt like they were using their advantages with their mutant powers which caused them to be ahead of him within the hunt. And from his perspective this wasn't fair, because though he didn't make it clear before he did want everyone to engage in this hunt without using powers. And it's here where he goes semi Glartrox, which we'll go into much deeper in just a minute. But with doing this, it causes a scuffle because he grabs Jubilee, then he grabs Richter. But not long after, they're able to restrain him because he didn't go full Glartrox, and we'll get to that. But it's immediately after this where Cullen stops the hunt, they take it back to the manor, and they rediscuss everything after dinner. With the topic being Cullen doesn't want them to use their mutant powers during the hunt. But that conversation also goes sideways. But when he does this, he really talks himself into a corner because he wants everyone else here who actually is a mutant to hunt like a human. But here's the thing, because in the case of Cullen who is a human, he was born human and he'd been human. But after his father had taken him on a trip to Clemore, the Black Realm, which for Cullen was like his father testing him on his birthday. And Cullen was supposed to prove himself while fighting out these creatures for a certain amount of time. But after his father had left him there, his father had actually died. So he was left there for like a little over two years before he was able to get out. And this is something you can imagine would take his toll on a kid that was only 10 years old when he went in and he was a little over 12 when he got out. But also I imagine it explains a bit of why he is the way he is today. Day. But also to clear up a bit of how his powers work if you will. Like while he was in the black dimension, a parasite called the Glartrox, it had bonded with his soul and at the time he could only keep it at bay with the ring that held a piece of the blood gem. So whenever he took it off he would go full Glartrox, which was pretty terrifying because this thing was huge, strong, and fast. And it grows even bigger when it feeds off of negative emotions. But since then, which I roughly say is like 7 years ago, and I'm only saying that because Avengers Arena came out in 2013, which would make him about 19, but through the years he's also learned to use the Glartrox very much like it's his own power. But with what I was saying about him talking himself into a corner, with him telling the members of Excalibur to move like humans and not mutants, Jubilee pretty much shuts this down with using her powers at the table and telling him like whether she uses her powers or not, she's still a mutant. Which is something that Betsy then builds on top of by pretty much telling him that using this ring and having a parasite it's a bit of a different situation which you can tell is like that's not where Cullen wanted to go with the conversation so he gets up like he's not even hungry anymore he lost his appetite and he just leaves but much later on once everybody's gone to sleep Richter then goes for a walk because he's having trouble sleeping and when he does he overhears Cullen having a conversation with someone over the phone who Richter believes to be Coven Akaba so of course he then tells Betsy who of course does admit that it's a wild accusation but it comes to the point where he suggests that they get what they need and get out of here because either waiting to find out if that's true or hunting with Cullen the next day and not using their powers against war wolves which are highly dangerous is like a lose-lose situation. So now with them sneaking out and trying to snatch up these heads and get up out of there, at this point Rogue who had absorbed some of the power from one of these war wolves and from there pretty much used this skin as a pelt, she then uses this method as an advantage to track more of them down. Which does prove to be quite effective but then when the ground starts shaking and there's like fireworks out outside, Cullen pretty much puts two and two together and he's like, okay, these mutants out here in these streets and they using their powers. 
which of course he's not too keen of but by the time he makes his way out there they've already collected like four out of the five heads that they needed and when cullen gets out there like they're only able to get away because rogue who was in disguise she's able to catch him off guard and knock cullen out just before they get ready to go but at this point with them already being like in cullen's bad graces they then just take the last skull that they need from cullen being that it was the one that he did collect while hunting without using the glartrox which now total gives them the five skulls that they needed but just before they go here comes the other issue and i really don't want to call it an issue but when we find out that what they had found and taken home with them had actually been a baby war wolf who of course they didn't want to kill but even still like everyone knew like when apocalypse has seen this thing he was gonna be like man what, what y'all doing and i'm not gonna front like when i first read this i thought it was gonna get dark but instead apocalypse more or less just told betsy that it's her choice to show mercy but with doing so it always comes at a cost but after this betsy then ends up giving the baby war wolf over to rachel summers which also makes sense because rachel was there like when we talked about uh uh, Excalibur issue number one from like 1987 or 88 when the war wolves had first came around and the team had been put together and we'll probably see much more of this going into the new X Factor series which I think was originally scheduled for April but at this point it'll probably be out around like May or June all right so jumping right back in for the most part this team has been covering some ground they've taken Avalon of Otherworld and placed an Omega level mutant at the throne by placing Jamie Braddock there who I'm a little worried about but for the most part I think he's gonna be okay and when I say I'm worried about him it's not so much if he's powerful enough but he's got a few screws loose so I feel like that may cause issues later on but we'll see but on top of that they've also made the Krakoan doorways accessible to Otherworld but even still with this we have the issue of the White Witch who prior to was at war with more Morgan Le Fay. But that's also where the war wolf skulls come in because apocalypse needed these to use a spell to light the way to the citadel of the white witch which more specifically is the starlight citadel which at one point was the home of merlin and his daughter roma but it's probably best known for being the former home of the captain britain corps which was formed by merlin who had created a captain britain for every universe for the purpose and intent of protecting the multiverse which later on would also include defending other world but also with your starlight citadel which has also been defined as like your center of all creation and your base for the Captain Britain Corps when they were a thing and it being a point of access to any Earth throughout the multiverse later its leadership role went from Roma to Opal Lunar Saturnine or just Saturnine for short but with Saturnine who was once a servant of Roma she then became and is still now the Omniversal Magistrix and it's her responsibility to make sure that the Starlight Citadel stays protected with it being like a gateway to the entire multiverse but lately it seems like this is mainly what Apocalypse has his eye on because with him needing the Warwolf skulls to find a way there, on top of doing his living autopsy on Morgan Le Fay. But with him doing these things, it's like we're seeing Apocalypse proving with his actions that his intentions are truly to protect Krakoa. And the way that this is given to us, it's much like this is something that lines up with Apocalypse and what he's been doing. Like with him splitting Krakoa in half from these unknown invaders. And the invaders cut Krakoa in half, but Apocalypse separate that half from the Krakoa we know today and the rest of the world. And to seal that off, he sent his first horsemen to fight off this invasion indefinitely and forever if need be which goes into that flashback which we had first seen back in powers of 10 which has been alluded to more recently within x-men dawn of x where we've come to find out that years later that those children of apocalypse or those original horsemen who have been gone for so long like they have later had children of their own but with everything that apocalypse is doing it seems like what had taken place this day when krakoa and arako its other half were separated that this is what apocalypse pursuit of the starlight citadel for the mastery of mutant magic to prepare himself and his nation to combat and likely eliminate this threat which would also be ideal if you were to take control of the starlight citadel but also to kind of paint the picture of the other things that are going on at the same time one of the main things is the continuing issue with brian braddock who even after his sister betsy had hidden the sword of might and it's almost like he feels himself being called to it but of course with his twin sister betsy and the link that they share she can sense that conflict with him but it's not like she can read his mind with their link being more of an empathic type of connection so the most that Betsy really knows is that he's sharing a feeling of a part of him missing, which could be her or just could be the Sword of Might. And my guess is on the Sword of Might. 
But over at the Citadel, at this point, we start to see where Apocalypse, his spell is working. Because literally out the blue, and no pun intended, but it might as well be. But out the blue, Apocalypse head just pops up in the sky. And everyone there is looking at it like, okay, well, that ain't regular. Because of late, Saturnine has wanted this place hidden. But now with Apocalypse staring this place down from the sky, it ain't so much hidden anymore. And so now, aside from Saturnine in the Citadel, and Excalibur within Otherworld making their way to the Citadel, on Earth in London, you have Coven Akai who have noticed that Morgan Le Fay is missing and Jamie Braddock is King of Avalon and for them Jamie is like the weakest link amongst the allies of Apocalypse and not so much because of his power but more so because they believe that Jamie can be easily provoked. But also amongst this meeting they call forth a random member to volunteer themselves as tribute and like a suffering sacrifice for the loss of Morgan Le Fay which gets super intense super quick and causes Megan to just run out of there. And so now for Megan, who had been working undercover with Pete Wisdom, which is something she's really good at because she's a shapeshifter. But in this case, when they got the carving coven members like Holiday Hams, she was just like, I bet I'm out. But when she comes out to meet Pete Wisdom, she's at least able to catch him up with what Coven Akaba has been up to. But back in Otherworld, with Excalibur making their way to the Starlight Citadel, on their way, Shogo gets hungry, so they make a quick stop to get something to eat. But it's also here where Betsy opens up a bit to Rogue, and mainly because Rogue is inquiring with Betsy being Captain Britain, and also being more familiar with the Starlight Citadel from having traveled there before, but mainly Rogue is trying to make sense out of a lot of this. Because at this point now, to our knowledge, like all the other Captain Britons have been destroyed, but for whatever reason, Betsy is not allowed to go there. And on top of that, up to this point, it's been hidden from her, just like everyone else, which is most likely with Betsy being a hero of two countries. But within the Citadel, where we had seen Saturnine was made aware of Apocalypse finding their location, it's here where we get a look at Saturnine's plans to protect the Starlight Citadel. And just to be clear from our talks in the previous video, Saturnine is the White Witch. And before, she was at war with Morgan Le Fay, but with Morgan Le Fay out of the picture, now Apocalypse is her issue. But at this point in the past, where we would have seen more likely uh, Captain Britain Corps protect the Citadel, but with them being destroyed, that has now become a job of the different priests who live inside the Citadel. And in defense, she uses the Rite of Initiation of the White Priestess, which is the Moonlight Diadem. And this is an insane amount of power which she draws from so that her priests would then mount these moon crests upon their forehead, which would then give them power to pull down light from the stars and turn them into constructs like arrows which can shoot as far as the stars. But I also want to mention like this entire lupine connection which also goes with Opal Luna and the priest with the moon symbols drawing light from the stars. This power essentially has a connection to every lupine creature which is more specifically why Apocalypse needed the war wolves to create a spell which would reverse engineer and find a way to Saturnine's location. But with the priest donning the moonlit diadem this ceremony is anything but quiet with them singing as part of the ritual, on top of the light show which both get Team Excalibur's attention, and when they approach the Citadel, Shogo gets shot down, which is pretty messed up because Shogo is a dragon. Okay, I get it. But at the same time, Shogo is still a baby. And even though Jubilee is not like Shogo's actual birth mother, like you couldn't tell her any different. And with seeing Shogo hurt this badly, Jubilee loses it. And she gives every last one of those priests and priestess the light show of a lifetime and she drops from the sky and just annihilates them and with doing so she literally cleans every last one of them off the map like they're gone and for saturnine who's watching this like she just lost world of warcraft or something but after seeing this she then pulls a team of her own that is like the captain britain version of the team of excalibur with her own jubilee her own richter gambit and rogue and in this moment it really feels like she's been forced to show her hand and use use something that she's been working on that she didn't necessarily want to reveal yet. Because this very much makes it appear like she's been working with Merlin and Roma on bringing back the Captain Britain Corps, which very much seems to be the case. And if so, it would also explain Merlin and Roma showing up to Brian Braddock recently and offering him the Sword of Might and the Amulet of Right, which of course we know he doesn't want to do because he's not 100% himself. But in the case that he was, without a doubt, he would have access to the Starlight Citadel, unlike Betsy because he's human. And at the time, had he perhaps chosen the amulet instead, like he originally did, 
he would have made his way to the Citadel and he would have seen the new plans of Saturnine. But with what has come to now with Apocalypse forcing her hand, it seems like Merlin and Roma, who are supposed to be missing, but instead they've been busy going throughout the multiverse and rebuilding the Captain Britain Corps and finding other champions who are associated either with Britain or that world's version of Britain, and in this case having to do so by finding champions who are not Brian Braddock, and mainly because all the other Brian Braddocks in the multiverse are dead, but with doing so secretly rebuilding the Captain Britain Corps. Which for me also sparks another pretty interesting thought, because if there's another Jubilee, Gambit, Richter, and Rogue who are in Britain in other multiverses, then there's likely other Krakoas as well. But so now real quick, just want to give a shout out to all the Patreons, thank you guys for all your support, and for anyone who wants information on how to become a Patreon and support the channel, I got a link down below where you can head over to patreon.com slash dopespill. But that'll do it for this one guys, let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Like for me personally, I want to see Apocalypse take the Starlight Citadel and turn the Cerebro Sword into the new Sword of Might. Because with him coming for the Citadel, which essentially means he's coming for Saturnine, Merlin, and Roma. But with doing so, I feel like the end result would just really be Apocalypse turning the Captain Britain Corps into the Horsemen of Apocalypse Corps, which I am also ready for. But what I'm not so ready for is for Brian Braddock to do something weird again and turn back into the Terminator slash Rambo slash He-Man slash Freddy Krueger thing we seen back in Inferno. And fingers crossed it won't come to that, which I don't think it will, but we'll see where it goes later. But until then, just let me know your thoughts down in the comments below, and we'll do it again in the next one. Alright, later.